Turing 6502, Absolute Addressing. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. So this is the block diagram for the Turing 6502 that we've built previously. Hopefully it's starting to look familiar to you. If not, it might be worth going back over part one, the rule book, and part two, the notepad. Now here are the 6502 instructions we've covered so far. Mightn't look much, but we're actually about to get into the heart of it. Over the next four or five videos, we'll fill out most of this table, and then there'll just be a little bit of cleanup at the end. Now I want to introduce the topic of address or addressing modes. So what are addressing modes? Well, they're different ways of specifying where in main memory the data is located for a given instruction. The effective address is where the data is stored, and the effective address is calculated as part of decode. Here's the Wikipedia entry for the instruction cycle, and you don't need to read all this, I just want to make you aware that the effective address calculation is part of the decode stage. The idea is that we can add added versatility to an instruction by allowing the data to be fetched in multiple different ways for any one given instruction. For example, the LDA instruction or load A instruction uses almost all of the addressing modes available. Sometimes the data might be in the next byte after the instruction, other times it's located in a physical address somewhere in memory, and sometimes there's a pointer in zero page which tells us where the data is. Strictly speaking, 6502 is defined as a partially orthogonal instruction set. That means we have multiple addressing modes, and multiple instructions can use the addressing modes, but not all instructions can use all modes. In the Turing 6502, I'm going to implement this with a two-pass decode. Here we have the full list of 6502 instructions. Now let's isolate some of these and look at them in more detail. So here we can see that the same instruction, or A in this case, uses multiple different addressing modes. The addressing mode determines where the data is, and the ORA instruction itself determines what's done with the data. Column A shows the instructions that are capable of using different addressing modes, and column B shows what the modes are. So we have to choose one from column A and one from column B. But not all combinations are valid. Now I've deliberately left out the jump instruction, and that's because I deal with each one independently. Now, we've seen some of these address modes before. In implied mode, the location of the data is implied by the instruction itself. For example, the TAX instruction is transfer data from A to X, and so the instruction tells us where the data is and where it's going to. A media addressing we've seen before in the last video with LDA, LDX, and LDY, and it's where the value is stored in the byte immediately after the instruction. Relative addressing is used for branch instructions, and in this case, the address offset is stored in the byte after the instruction. In this video, we're going to look at absolute, absolute X, and absolute Y addressing. In the next video, we're going to look at zero page addressing, which actually has five different addressing modes. Then, a bit later in the series, we'll go over indirect mode, which is really only used for jumps. Here we can look at the instructions that use absolute addressing, and we've already seen the jump instruction. Let's have a look at the store A instruction in absolute mode. The upcode for this instruction is 8D, and here we can see an 8D at 7BBC. So for the store A absolute instruction, the address is in there two bytes immediately after the opcode. So ideally, what we want to have happen is for the CE at location 7BBD to go into the EAL variable which also gets reflected in the MAR low flip-flops. And then we want the 7B at 7BBE to go into the EAH variable, which gets reflected into the MAR high flip-flops. And now what we want to do is take the value of E3 in the accumulator and store it in the memory location pointed at by the MAR high and MAR low flip-flops. So now we write the value E3 into address 7BCE. So I'm going to do the decode in two parts, called first pass and second pass decode. Now first pass decode is compulsory, every instruction goes through this, and instructions with only one addressing mode will jump straight to their execution cycle after this. But for instructions that have multiple addressing modes, we'll compute the effective address in this first pass. The idea being that the EA registers hold the address, and these are reflected in the MAR output flip-flops. Then, when appropriate, after first pass decode, we go into second pass decode. 
here we can see what's computed in the first pass. Now the second pass decode is optional. Not all instructions have a second pass decode. But the second pass decode, the instruction register still holds the instruction to be executed, and the MAR holds the address of the data. The program counter points to the next instruction, minus 1. And in general, the MAR high flip-flops won't hold the value of the PCH variable. So that means we need to do a full fetch again. In the first pass, we look at the address mode. But in the second pass, we look at the instruction to be executed. Then we jump to the appropriate state machine to service this instruction. Here are all the instructions that use absolute addressing. And I'm going to focus in on the SDA, LDA, and Compare Ray instructions. But the concepts generalize to all the other instructions except for Jump and JSR, which I'll handle separately. Let's look at our C code for doing the instruction cycle. In the first pass, these three instructions jump directly to the absolute addressing mode service routine. Here we start by incrementing the program counter. Then we load the next value from main memory into the EAL variable. Increment program counter again and load the next value from memory into the EAH variable, then jump to the second pass decode. There we form a big switch statement with the instruction register variable, and we jump to the various service routines for the instructions. At this point, the instruction doesn't know what addressing mode is being used, it just knows that the address of the data is stored in the EAL and the EAH variables. The store A instruction is pretty straightforward. We just write the value in the A register variable, into the memory location pointed to by the effective address. And then we're done. So let's see how we might do it as a state machine. Hopefully it doesn't come as much of a surprise that the first thing we do is add extra arcs out of rule 28, or state 28. Then for mode ABS, the first thing we do is increment the program counter, read the value into EAL, increment the program counter, read the value into EAH, and then touch EAL again. And the reason we need to do that is because the value in MAR low would have become corrupted by the increment of the PC. Then we call another state machine called second pass decode. And this looks a lot like instruction decode. It's just a single rule with a large number of arcs coming out of it. But this time the arcs for 8D, AD, and CD go to the instruction execution machines directly. Store is pretty straightforward. We just write the value into main memory and then jump to fetch full. We don't need to update any flags at this stage. Now let's have a look at the rules or states we move through for a store A absolute instruction. So we start off at state 28, go to 863, 865, 866, 868, 869, 29, 2019, and back to 23, which is the start of full fetch. Now let's look at the real machine and see what we can see running. Fetch and decode 8D at rule 28. Jump to mode absolute. Increment PC. Load EAL. Increment PC. Load EAH. Touch EAL again. Go to second pass at rule 29 and jump to instruction store and write the final value. And then go to full fetch for the next instruction. Surprisingly, the Pac Man code doesn't use absolute addressing that much. It uses a variant called absolute x and absolute y addressing. Absolute x and absolute y are basically the same, so I'll just concentrate on absolute x for the moment. So this instruction starts out the same as absolute addressing. It's a three byte instruction where the first byte's the opcode and then that's followed by two bytes of address. The address gets loaded into the effective address register. But then we add the value in index X or the value in index Y to the effective address register. Now this is an eight bit addition to a 16 bit number. But in this case, we just do a straight addition. We don't need to sign extend. So the eight bit hexadecimal value, XX, becomes the 16-bit value 00xx. These are all the instructions that use absolute x addressing. And again, we'll just focus on store, load, and compare. So let's walk through an example of absolute x addressing with the store a instruction. Its opcode is 9d, and here we can see one stored at 6e8d. 
After we interpret the instruction, the first thing we want to do is transfer the zero at 6E8E into our EAL register variable. Then we want to store the 09 at 6E8F into our EAH register variable. So this gives us a base address of 0900 hex. But in this addressing mode, we want to offset that by the value in IX. We make IX a 16-bit value with the upper 8 bits being set to 0. Then we add this to the EAL and EAH variables. The results are stored in EAL and EAH, and these get reflected into the MA low and MA high flip-flops. The MA now points to 901, and now we take the value in the A register, which is 0, and store it at that location. Now, with our C model, we add these opcodes as cases within our decoder, and all of them call the absolute X routine. Now the first part of absolute and absolute X are the same. We increment the PC, load a value from memory into EAL, increment the PC again, and then load another value from memory into EAH. But now we want to add in the value of the index X variable. But I don't really want to do a 16-bit add. So what I'll do is check to see whether the sum of IX and EAL is greater than 255. If it is, I'll increment the EAH variable. Then all I have to do is add index X to the EAL variable, store the result in EAL, and not worry about carry. And when I'm done, I go to second pass decode. In second pass decode, I add the opcode for all these instructions as case statements. This is basically the same as we did for absolute addressing mode, except the opcodes are slightly different. SDA is the same as it was before, which really is the point of doing it this way. Going back to our state machine, we add these new instructions as arcs out of rule 28, and all of these new arcs go to the absolute x state machine, and the first part of this is the same as absolute. We increment the PC, load EAL, increment the PC again, and then load EAH. But now things get tricky, we want to add EAL to index x. So now I convert the index x value into a state number. In our most recent example, index x held a value of 1. So state 876 goes to state 878. Then we read in the value of EAL and write back the value plus 1. Similarly, if we were at 879, we'd read the value of EAL and write back the value plus 2. When the sum of IX and EAL is greater than 255, we go to state 1137 and increment the EAH variable. And we continue this for all possible values of index X. We add these opcodes into second pass decode as we did for absolute mode. And store is the same as before. Now let's look at the states we go through for this example. 28, 870, 872, 873, 875, 876, 878, 29, 2019, then back to 23. Load 9D into the instruction register. Go to instruction decode. Increment PC. Load EAL. Increment PC. Load EAH. Now we read index X. And fan out to one of the states that represents the value in index X. We read EAL and add the value of index X as represented by the state number. Then we go to second pass decode with 901 in our memory address register, then state 2019 for store. Then back to full fetch. And we need full fetch because the values in the MAR low and the MAR high flip flops have been corrupted. Many of the instructions that use absolute X addressing mode also use absolute Y. These instructions have their own opcode, so they have extra entries into Rule 28, but the machines for Absolute X and Absolute Y are almost identical. The only difference is at Rule 875 and 1143, we just swap IX for IY. So once Absolute X addressing mode was working, getting Absolute Y to work was pretty straightforward. Well, we've come to the end of this video. Next video, we'll be looking at zero page addressing. And as usual, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.